In the last two lessons on the cell theory, we took a journey through history and learned a little bit about some of the early scientists using some of the newly invented microscopes, and they made basic discoveries about the structure of living things. Living things were composed of cells, so plants and animals were multicellular, but in addition, on planet Earth, there are single-celled organisms like didinium and paramecium, and very tiny organisms, single-celled organisms called bacteria. This discovery um, makes up one of the key pillars of what we're going to call the cell theory, that all living things on planet Earth are composed of cells or exist as a single cell. The question remained, uh, what are cells doing that gives them this property of being alive? And in the 1800s, uh, people like Henri Dutrochet helped us understand what these cells were. They were little compartments with boundaries here that we call the cell membrane and inside that chamber was a fluid that today we call the cytoplasm and something very important was happening in that fluid chemistry so Dutrochet argued that cells were alive and they are the units of life and what's happening inside cells is chemistry and to perform this chemistry properly the cell needed to acquire nutrients from the environment and as a result of this chemistry waste products would be produced and those waste products had to be eliminated from the cell another scientist at the time wrote each cell selects from its surrounding milieu taking only what it needs so scientists began to suspect that this boundary this membrane was selectively permeable it allowed certain materials into the cell but blocked the entry of other types of things in the environment and we'll see how that is important for life as we study cells later in, in the course uh, in addition um, we can think of this cell membrane then as regulating the flow of materials into and out of the cell as well as just keeping all of the chemicals uh, closely confined so that they can interact to perform this chemistry of life so we can use a sort of a metaphor we can think of a cell as a kind of chemical laboratory and if this chemistry is proceeding properly then the whole unit here has the property of being alive if we think back to uh, um, the observations by Schleiden he was the botanist who discovered that plants were multicellular and he also uh, pointed out that the cells of a plant had different appearances under the microscope and they seemed to be doing different jobs they had different functions so at this time then people like Dutrochet and others were arguing that cells that appeared to do different jobs perhaps were performing different chemical reactions within their boundaries so for example the leaf cells and the root cells they're all part of the plant and they're helping each other survive but they are different precisely because there's different chemistry going on inside those cells today for example we understand that in the leaf cells the leaf cells have structures called chloroplasts where photosynthesis is occurring and that process is not happening in the root cells so at this stage then we're going to add a second pillar to our cell theory that cells are the basic unit of life now also in the 1800s other individuals were making fundamental discoveries about cells for example Robert Brown identified that plant cells seem to have this oval structure that he called the nucleus he looked at lots of different kinds of plant cells and would always find this oval structure inside these cells here we see the nucleus of a leaf cell here we see several leaf cells stuck together because plants are multicellular and we see the nucleus indicated these locations now of course nobody at the time understood what the nucleus was for and that would have to uh, be discovered later on let's take a look at some other pictures of cells that have nuclei here we see animal cells cheek cells from a human and we have the stained nucleus here we have a paramecium a large single celled organism with a nucleus and down here we have another leaf cell now there's something strange about this picture the nucleus appears detached from the rest of the cellular material here and there is a story behind that that picture was taken in the following way first you take a freshwater uh, species of plant that you might find in a fish tank and you put the leaf uh, on a slide under the microscope now there's lots of water in the cytoplasm of the cell here but when you add salt water 
to the leaf, something interesting happens. Because salt water has less water, after all there's salt dissolved in it, whereas fresh water doesn't have the salt, we have a situation where there's actually more water in terms of the concentration. The concentration of water is higher inside the cell than in the surrounding salt water. And that produces something called osmosis, where water starts to leave the cell. It moves from areas of high concentration to areas of lower concentration. As water leaves the cell, the membrane of the leaf cell begins to pull away from the rigid cell wall. So it's kind of like the cell is shrinking as it's losing its water. And so the contents of the cell are being sort of confined into a smaller and smaller volume. So here we see again several cells are shrinking. Notice the cell wall doesn't change its uh, shape, right? That's a rigid structure. It's what allows plants to support their weight against gravity. But the membrane is a very flexible structure and as water leaves the cells they shrivel up. You get to a situation like this where all the cell contents are confined within the membrane leaving the cell wall. Incidentally, uh, remember Hook put quirk tissue under the microscope and found those empty chambers. So he was looking at the cell walls of plant cells, but all of the fluid and all the cellular contents had disappeared. They were dead cells. Uh, another uh, point to remind ourselves about is that animal cells don't have these rigid cell walls. Animal cells just have the cell membrane. All cells on earth have a cell membrane. Plant cells also have a cell wall. Now, back to this picture then, apparently during the shriveling process, the nucleus, which would have been within the cell membrane, found its way, it poked its way outside of the cell membrane, and we see it here separated from the rest of the cell contents, all the chloroplasts and, and uh, the remaining fluid there. But let's get back to what was the nucleus for? Well, today we understand that the nucleus is a membrane within which that volume is a very important molecule called DNA. And we now know that DNA is the recipe to build an organism. Specifically, DNA stores the instructions to build a very important kind of molecule called a protein. And it's proteins that perform the chemistry of life. So DNA then would be a set of recipes to build really important molecules called proteins. And it's proteins that are performing the chemistry that keeps a cell alive. Let's dig into that for a little bit. Here we see a cartoon cell. This would be one of the simplest kinds of cells on Earth, a bacterium. And what we're showing here are cartoon versions of some of these molecules that cells are made of. Of course, molecules are themselves composed of atoms of different kinds, chemically bonded to each other. So we'll learn a lot more about how cells operate in later units. But the idea is all cells have this membrane boundary, and some cells have a cell wall. Some bacteria have a cell wall. Plant cells have a cell wall. Animals don't. But all these other structures are large molecules called proteins. And these proteins are doing different chemical reactions inside the cell. So let's identify some of these uh, different kinds of molecules. So we've got proteins, and they're going to be performing lots of different kinds of chemical reactions. We've got sugars. This, for lots of cells on Earth, this is a source of energy. Uh, we've got the membrane itself is composed of molecules called lipids. And then we have this important molecule, DNA. This is the DNA that is found inside the nucleus of plants and animals and paramecia and amoeba, etc. But bacteria also have DNA. It's just that it's not surrounded by a nuclear membrane. Now, we will learn that these proteins do different jobs. Some proteins are involved in harnessing energy from the environment. Some proteins are involved in building molecules that cells are made of. Other proteins are involved in, in you know, uh, building DNA and, and uh, using DNA information to build the rest of the cell's proteins. So proteins are the key players for life on Earth. And these proteins have different jobs, different functions. Well, as we've sort of learned a little bit, uh, just as the praying mantis has parts with purpose, the spikes allow it to uh, grasp its prey and hold on to its prey better than if you didn't have spikes, that is what we call an adaptation. So too, these proteins are molecular adaptations. And as such, they have evolved by this evolutionary process. That's how they got their purposes. That's how they got their jobs. Proteins 
are the result of an evolutionary process. And we will learn the proteins are related to DNA. It's DNA that stores the recipes to build each and every protein. And since DNA can change over time, we call them mutations. Since DNA can change, that means the recipe to build proteins can change, which means that cells can change over time. And so living things can evolve over time. We'll study that in later units. But for us right now, we want to think about cells as knowing how to be alive. One scientist at the time said the cell is a closed unit of life that bears within itself the laws governing its existence. And so the existence of a living thing demands or requires that the chemistry of life is happening inside this membrane boundary and the laws governing this chemistry we can think of that as being the result of the presence of dna dna has the instructions to build all of these proteins that are doing the chemistry of life in addition uh, none of the molecules that make up a cell are alive yet the whole cell is alive so that means that life is a process, a set of chemical reactions confined within a membrane boundary. So we don't want to think of life as a, as a thing. It's a process. And on Earth, it's a process that's happening inside these small units that we call cells. And the cell membrane is the boundary of this living unit. We'll be learning a lot more about the chemistry of life in the course, but here we have two cartoon cells side by side. We have a bacterial cell and a more complex cell that you would find in a plant or an animal or dendidium, paramecium, amoeba. And we will be learning that there are lots of similar processes happening in all cells on Earth, but there are some notable differences between these two kinds. First of all, the bacteria cells are much smaller. These are the smallest, simplest kinds of cells on planet Earth. In addition, uh, the larger types of more complicated cells have the nuclear membrane around their DNA, and they have structures like mitochondria, and we'll study uh, these features later in the course. But at this point, then, we have our second pillar well established, then, that cells are the basic unit of life, and a cell is the smallest living thing. Cells are made of molecules which themselves are not alive. Not even DNA is alive. Um, and as for the third principle of the th cell theory, it will answer the question, where did cells come from? And we'll take that up in the next lesson.